I just want you to know, I don't believe it's an accident that you're here today. And uh, we are going to continue. We've been tracking through 1 Corinthians since the first Sunday in January. And today we're moving into a new section that uh, is very exciting. We're going to look at chapters 12, 13, and 14 as a section. It's a section on spiritual gifts. And as we have been journeying uh, through 1 Corinthians, uh, I've been excited personally for our church and uh, because we're Pentecostal, and I, we're unashamed of Pentecostal. We're an Assembly of God church, and uh, when we, we knew we were going to get here to chapter 12, and uh, as, as Assemblies of God people, we hang our hats on some of the verses that are found here. And uh, it's interesting, as I was praying and just kind of meditating over the, the material for this week, I had this sense in my heart. I, I, I wrote it down, and I said, I feel like I have been preparing my entire adult life for this particular section of Scripture to share this. And so the learning and the perspective and seeking of truth, and uh, I just believe that God has a plan for each and every one of us uh, in this, uh, this section of Scripture. And my desire, just to be right up front, is to be balanced with our truth, okay? And, uh, that, and today in particular, it, we're going to kind of take an introductory look, but to focus on what's true and what's agreed upon across denominations, to kind of identify some things that uh, others would believe. But really today, the purpose to, to really say, hey, what are these spiritual gifts or what are they overall? What is the purpose of them? Now, I also know that we come from a lot of different backgrounds to make up the Gateway Church. And I want to be respectful to that, and I want to be just encourage you. I've got some thoughts a little later. Um, but at, before we get into the material, I want to remind us of what 1 Corinthians has been. It's important to remember that Paul is writing to the Corinthian leaders, right? We know that. And there were several letters that went back and forth uh, between the Corinthian leaders and between Paul. And Paul, he absolutely loved this church. He cared for them. He had planted this church, and he had invested in them deeply. And so when he's writing to the Corinthian church, he talked about division and how destructive that was. He's talked about pride and wisdom issues. Are, are people going to follow man's wisdom or God's wisdom? Uh, he, we talked about cultural issues. We've talked about sexuality, the theology of Bible, of, uh, or not of the Bible, of, of the body. Uh, we've talked about communion, and then we've spent a whole lot of time talking about our liberty. Most of the summer, talking about our liberty in Christ. And what it's been, this book has been for us, it's a textbook for today. For us to be able to get our minds around and to, to say, okay, God, what are you saying? See, the Corinthian church, they had been influenced heavily by their culture. And when you look at the American church, and I would say even our church, we have been affected by our culture. And so we need to take to heart what Paul is trying to communicate. And so when we get to chapter 12, 13, and 14 in regards to spiritual gifts, what's interesting is most commentators believe that, it, that most likely the Corinthian leaders had recognized that there was something wrong when it came to spiritual gifts. Something was going on that needed some, they needed some wisdom, some correction, and uh, some insight in this area. And so Paul in a masterful way, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he deals with the abuses of spiritual gifts. That's the overriding context. And when we look at 12, 13, and 14, we're going to see some instruction. We're going to see some inspiration. We're also going to see some correction uh, to, for the leaders. But what I really want us to see, even from this early stage, is that it's all nestled in this idea that everything is to be done in love sacrificial love. The love chapter is strategically placed right between 12 and 14, and you're going to see how those all tie together. It's going to be exciting, and I want you to make sure you make it a priority this fall, uh, and as the school has started, come be a regular part. We really encourage you to do so. But before we dive into the actual text, we're going to try to capture the first seven verses today. Uh, I want to give some general principles to kind of lay a foundation, some core beliefs for the Gateway Church. And maybe you're just visiting, or maybe you've been here a long time, and maybe you didn't know these, but uh, and these core beliefs or these principles are bigger than just 12, 13, and 14 in Corinthians. And the first one is this, that spiritual gifts are for all believers, and they are for today. All right? Now, this is important. We believe this. We embrace this, that every believer, every single one of us 
in this room that calls Jesus their Lord, these spiritual gifts are for you. You are eligible to utilize the gifts that we will be discussing over the next several weeks. That is exciting, and I hope you're excited about that. Now, some would say that the list in 8 to 10 that we're going to read in a little bit are not for today. People will pick and choose and say, ah, some gifts, are, are spiritual gifts are for, you know, always, some were only for the early church. And, uh, and I'll tell you, it makes me sad, number one. But I've been reading a lot this week, and, uh, and really for that past couple weeks, it really kind of makes me mad as well. <laughs> because some of the, the solid theological uh, resources that I've been leaning on throughout this series don't embrace the gifts of the Spirit the way we do. And so it's challenged me to go beyond that, but to understand kind of what, where they're coming from. And, and so you ask the question, I've been asking the question, how could they say that some gifts were for today and some are not? How do they just differentiate? And the, the, the view is called a sensational view, and so that some gifts stopped with the apostles. You say, well, where does that come from? And I want to just show you 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can sh- uh, turn with me there. It's very interesting. Um, there's a few different arguments, but this is the most prevalent. Let's look at what it says. After the love is patient, kind, all those things, love never fails. Then it says in verse 8, it says, But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Now, I want you to know, that what people believe, there were some believe, is that they believe that perfection has come, and that is the Word of God, okay? And I believe that the copy of God's Word that I'm holding is perfection. It is God's Word. It's our standard. But I don't believe that that's the context. I do not believe uh, that what, the, what this is saying here is the Word of God, and I'll, we'll kind of see it as we track through. But when perfection comes, the imperfect will disappear, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. To me, when I look at verse 12 in particular, I, I re- look at this and I've studied this. To me, what it's talking about is very clearly heaven. It's eternity. That when we see God face to face, at that point, we will be in perfection. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, kind of supporting uh, that idea. uh, 1 John chapter 3, it's very interesting. Listen to what it says in verse 2. It says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. Once we've accepted Christ, we're a child of God. We believe that. We embrace that. But on this side of eternity, and what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't know all things yet. We don't understand all things. But we know that when He appears, when Christ returns, the second coming, uh, uh, when, the, when we are raptured, or when we, when we uh, experience eternity, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as he is. Church, at that moment, there will be perfection. We'll see him face to face. The blinders will be off, and at that moment, tongues and prophecy and the need for some of the gifts will have diminished because we will know fully at that moment. Now today, I'll stand before you, I'll be the first to admit, I don't understand all things. And I believe that until Jesus returns, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the spiritual gifts to help us. Amen? Amen. And some people would say, well, (laughs) they're not for today. I would say, well, what do you do with this list? In uh, Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, picking and choosing. Some would say, well, faith is okay, but not healing. Or discernment is okay, but not prophecy. Or knowledge is okay, but not tongues. And I would say, what, on what basis do you put your faith? Or how would you pick and choose? Because God gave spiritual gifts to build the church. That's the bottom line. In church, we are still building the church. And so... I believe pretty passionately that the spiritual gifts are still for today. 
And that was the first principle. <laughs> and they're for all believers. The second principle is this, that 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, is not a complete listing of spiritual gifts. And this is an important piece. Uh, Paul's intentions was never to supply a complete list. It was inspired by God, yes, but these were fragments, and they were for a specific reason. And what's interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we're going we're gonna to see here, in verses 8 through 10, which I want you to just kind of focus there for a moment, we see nine gifts. Let's look at them. Message of wisdom, message of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, uh, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues, Okay. In verse 28, we see some more. Apostleship, prophets, teachers, workers of miracles, uh, uh, gifts of healing, uh, gifts of administration, different kinds of tongues. Okay, we see another list there. Then if you flip back just a few uh, pages in your Bible to Romans chapter 12, we see another list. This is still Paul speaking, or through the Holy Spirit, of course. But he says, look, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying or serving or teaching or encouraging or contributing to the needs of others or leadership or showing mercy, and he lists a, a bunch of, of, of gifts there, and then one other or two other places, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and I know I'm having you jump around a little bit here, but uh, try to track with me just for a second. I think it's interesting when we see this. We see there that he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, teachers, preachers. Uh, there and then even Peter in 1 Peter 4 10 through 11 there's another list <coughs> you put these together there are roughly 20 or more spiritual gifts listed but none of these passages provide a list in its entirety it's to be representative in nature not to be comprehensive or to be exhaustive and I think that's really important for us to understand in fact Gordon Fee when he looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the list there in 8 to 10, at the end of, of 10, it says, and still another interpretation of tongues, according to the Greek structure in the, in the original language, the, Gordon Fee says it would be et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could list another one after another one after another one. And that's important to, to understand. You'll see why as we track through these next several weeks. By the way, some people like to categorize these spiritual gifts and I do think that there's some benefit to that, uh, the proclamation gifts, the miracle gifts, uh, speaking gifts, serving gifts, signs gifts, but it was, it's very clear in the text that it was never Paul's intention to combine gifts and uh, to give them special emphasis at all. These are all spiritual gifts, all given by God for specific reasons at specific times. The third principle is this, and this is kind of fun one to talk about, that spiritual gifts are not the same as natural abilities. Okay? Now, this is fun. The ability to cook. My wife is an incredible cook. I love it when she cooks for us. I mean, it's, it's good. If you've been over our house, some of you have. Um, but that is not a spiritual gift. Okay? That's a natural gift. The ability to play an instrument, to play the keys, or to play the guitar, or the banjo, or a flute, or piccolo <laughs> or that we were talking about yesterday that is not a spiritual gift the ability to work with wood is a natural gift the ability to speak a foreign language is a natural ability For, let me give you an example if you were called to work at the un and maybe you were uh, an interpreter you're listening to to different uh, dialects and tongues and you're bringing interpretation uh, that is, you are not working in the spiritual realm. That's a natural gift at work. The same thing for a doctor. A doctor that works with medicine or even, you know, holistic uh, training and where, you know, different things. Um, a, a doctor is not necessarily working in the gift of healing, okay? There's a distinction. Spiritual gifts are divinely empowered, gifts beyond our natural abilities, and the spiritual dimension is always at work uh, when spiritual gifts are utilized. Now, I do know that God can and does take our natural ability and he enhances the natural. We saw that this morning with worship. Uh, Jonathan leading, he has natural ability to sing or to play guitar, but there was a supernatural anointing in that moment for that time, and, and we recognize that. But God may or may not use your natural ability. 
There are times God will take someone that is very introverted, very shy, inward, and give them a gift of faith and said, you've got to speak this out publicly, right? That can happen. Or on the flip side, that God can take someone that is outgoing and boisterous and willing to speak, but give them the gift of wisdom or knowledge or discernment that is more behind the scenes. See, spiritual gifts are unique gifts given to ministers to the body as God desires. And what we're going to see throughout this passage, throughout these three, three chapters and throughout these set next several weeks, is that it, they always bring glory to God. So let's look at these first seven verses. I want you to stand with me. We're going to read these. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, I encourage you just to slip out, grab a copy. We're going to read this. You'll, you'll catch up. and You can kind of follow along. And when we focus on these uh, particular uh, seven verses, there's one pastor that I really appreciated. He kind of narrowed the focus in, in three areas, and he's smarter than I am. He, they all start with F. He says there's a forward, which is kind of like the preface, uh, and then there's the foundation of the gifts, and then the function of the gifts. And so we're going to kind of follow that pattern this morning. But let's look at chapter 12, starting in verse number 1. Paul says, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, or no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Let's pray. Lord, your word is really awesome. It's really beneficial to understand, to get our minds around. And God, I just pray that you would illuminate, uh, Lord, you take my natural ability to talk and bring supernatural insight, God, uh, through the gift of preaching and teaching. And God, I just pray that you would just be honored with everything that is said and done. Open up our hearts. Let the barriers just uh, be melted down because of love. Lord, help us to love well and to embrace your word today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. You can be seated this morning. And I uh, just want to welcome, we, there's some folks that haven't been here a long time, and uh, it's great to have you back, and uh, some others that are guests, and uh, it's just a, a good day to be in God's house. When we look at verse number one, I'd never studied this to the extent that I have been. It says, now about spiritual gifts, brothers. Well, in the original language there, the word gifts is not included. It would say in the original, now about spirituals, which is kind of curious. So he's kind of moving into a section talking about spiritual ideas, spiritual things. Now, this the idea of the Corinthian church being spiritual was not foreign to them at all. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we started this whole series back in January. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, look what it says. He's talking to the Corinthian church. He says, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And what I want you to see is that they did not lack any spiritual gifts. They were full of these spiritual gifts were active and actually to the point where it actually got out of hand. And we're going to, we'll get to that. But it, they, they had problems, but they were, the gifts were there. And the gifts are always there when God's people come together. What I want you to know is that we, the Gateway Church, we do not lack any spiritual gifts. Let me show you why. At any given time, the gifts are being utilized right here. Gifts of help, gifts of service, the prophetic. Um, it's interesting. Some people are like, well, there's not so, you know, we don't hear prophecy or tongues interpretation all that often. What about that? Well, li listen, what I believe is that when I preach, there's the prophetic at work uh, almost every week, and, uh, and, and God will give insight for our future through the foolishness of preaching. My voice is getting real scratchy. Can you get me a, a glass of water or something? <coughs> Excuse me. So the point is here is that you can experience, you can exercise the gifts, but Paul is saying, look, I don't want you just to experience these. 
I want you to know about these spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant. And he's used that term four different, uh, that phrase four times already. And uh, he's saying, look, this is important. And just because the gifts are present did not mean that the church was in a healthy place. And boy, that's an interesting concept because you can walk into a church and see the gifts of the spirit or gifts, the gifts of the, or the spiritual gifts at work. And uh, what's interesting is that it doesn't, it's not a, always an indicator of spiritual health and uh, very important. So then we looked at verse 2, all right? Verse 2 says this, Now, when you were, uh, I know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced or led astray by mute idols. We've talked about this at length, that the Corinthian church was heavily influenced. Uh, there were many of the Christians in the Corinthian church that had a pagan background. They left the temple worship and came to Christ. And uh, what was going on there, in many cases, was de- the demonic was at work behind the scenes. And there were mysterious things, ecstatic things, experiences that would mimic the Holy Spirit. And so what was interesting, part of the abuse that we're seeing, is that the Corinthian believers were mixing some of their pagan practices with Holy Spirit truths and trying to mingle the two. And Paul's already said you can't do that, but uh, he, that's what he's referring to in verse 3. And then in verse, or verse 2, and then in verse 3, it says, Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit uh, himself. Now, non-Pentecostal scholars will take that verse. Thanks, Pete. I really appreciate that. What's, what's in that water, man? I was just kidding you. There's nothing in it. <laughs> There's nothing in it. What people will do with this particular verse, and I think it's uh, really sad, is they'll, non-Pentecostals will look at that verse and say, that's exactly what happens when the gifts of the Spirit or the spiritual gifts It's just a free-for-all, and people will even stand up and say, Jesus is cursed, right? And I would say, okay, we got to understand that when spiritual gifts are given, they flow through human beings like you and me, okay? Now, let me uh, track with me, and we are people of the flesh utilizing the Spirit, but I do believe that God still chooses to use humans with spiritual gifts. I was telling the story first service that when uh, Jessica and I, uh, on our first mission trip, the mission trip that we met on, before we went to Mexico City, we were doing this choir tour, and we were uh, singing. It was just a really beautiful moment, and uh, the song kind of came to an end. It was one of those really reverent moments. And one of the guys, do you remember this, in our, uh, in our group, he's, he's a little older than us, probably 23, 24, 25. He's like shaking, he's like, stop and he like yelled out at the top of his life lungs and he's and he goes there's sin here we must take care of it and and everyone was like totally freaked out the leaders came up kind of helped ex- escort him to the side and uh, rick pasquale one of the missionaries we support kind of stepped up and kind of took control of the service kind of explained some things and what was interesting i believe that the message was right on that there was no question there but he was using an imperfect person, and it was totally out of order, totally disruptive, and actually scary. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so and that was, I don't think we'll ever forget that, will we, Jessica? It was really crazy. But my heart, let me just hear me out, is that I would rather take a wild horse, okay, and rein it in a little bit than to try to resurrect a dead one, okay, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit or the spiritual gifts. I need to be careful there, because we'll, I'll talk to you about that in a second. And the point here in verse 3, when you look at that, is when the gifts are operational, God gets the glory, all right? And so we can evaluate, okay, is Christ being exalted here? Who is exalted? And if it's a person being exalted, you know, with a gift of healing or a gift of prophecy or a gift of whatever, if a person is highly, oh, look at him or look at her, listen, you need to be careful. The Spirit of God will always exalt Jesus. That is critical. And so that's why Paul starts with this forward, with this preface. And then he moves into the foundation of the spiritual gifts. Let's look at verses 4 through 6 together. It says now, I'm sorry, it says there are different kinds of gifts, 
but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now there's something here that I want you to see. That last little phrase, works all of them in all men. I just want to reiterate that we believe that these spiritual gifts are for every single one of us to tap into. But there are some, uh, three, fa- three phrases that I think that kind of popped out to me. The first is this different kinds. Three different times it says different kinds. And what I know about the Spirit of God and spiritual gifts is, is that there is variety. There's variety when the supernatural is at work. And I believe that God loves variety. You take the nine gifts in chapter uh, 12, verse 8 through 10, and you put those in conjunction, and oftentimes those do not work on their own. The gift of healing is with a gift of miracles or the gift of tongues with interpretation of tongues. The combination, the possibilities are endless. There's incredible diversity with these spiritual gifts. The second phrase is the gifts service, and working. What I see here are different categories of how God works. They're different, but they're all energized by God. And then that other phrase is same Spirit, same Lord, same God. And church, I've got to acknowledge here, this, this is off my radar, but listen, there's some powerful theology right here that the Father Okay, the God, Father God, the same Lord, the Lord Jesus, the Son, and the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, are at work in these gifts. And I've been challenged in my reading recently here that we want to make sure we call these spiritual gifts not just gifts of the Spirit. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are at work. And I think to say the gifts of the Spirit is incomplete. Now, if you say that and you slip up like I'm going to, because that, boy, that's my background, gifts of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, but I think it's incomplete. And what I see is that there's unity in the diversity, that we are not all the same. Look around, and there's no one here that looks quite alike. Even identical twins are not the same. And when we come together as a body of believers, we don't necessarily all believe the same either, and we can agree to disagree in love. And I'm totally okay with that. You can worship here with different opinions. Some people say, well, you know, there's so many denominations. God up in heaven, he must be so disappointed in all the churches and all the splits and all these things. And I, you know, I'm sure God doesn't like the split, but listen, when it comes to different denominations and beliefs, I think God's okay with that. We've got two kids, Jessica and I do, And they are completely different individuals. They think differently. They act differently. They say different things. And they're different. And I think when we look at the church, the church of God in a whole, we're all part of a team. And I said first service, the NFL started this week, and I know some of you guys are excited about that Thursday night. But listen, there was not one NFL team that showed up with a different strategy saying, you know what? Everyone on the team is going to play the same position. We're all going to be quarterbacks this year. That's going to be the ticket to the Super Bowl. I mean, that'd be ludicrous, right? In a team, there are different flavors, different responsibilities. We're going to see that as we track through chapter 12. But the same team, in what unity, it does not mean uniformity. And I think God's okay with that. And And by the way, I don't believe that we have the corner on the market when it comes to spiritual gifts as well and we'll talk more about that but listen we've talked about the pre- the preface the foundation but then we get to verse 7 and this was a shocker to me as well verse 7 most commentators believe even non pentecostal uh, um, uh, commentators believe that uh, that verse 7 is the key to 12 1 through 14 40 is, is found in verse 7. So let's look at that and try to get our mind around it. It says this, Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, there's, a, there's quite a bit there, but what I want you to see on the front side is that each one. 
again, that all believers, that we, that's for all of us, each one, in each one of these spiritual gifts, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Why? For the common good. And church, I want to challenge you, young people to the oldest among us, that you are uniquely made for the common good. No one can do what you do, especially empowered by the Holy Spirit and by with spiritual gifts. The reason we exist is to bring glory to God. Plus, when the gifts are utilized and are operational, the body of Christ is strengthened. No leader can do what you do. And that means that you need to be engaged for the common good. I believe that God desires to use me. I believe he does use me in spiritual gifts. But I'm the pastor, and it doesn't stop here. Each and every one of us can be used with spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are at our disposal. Once we understand them, we can embrace them, and we can move in those gifts. And I want to say something that can be kind of harsh, and I want to say it in love, and I want you to hear it in a spirit of love. But church, if you are not being utilized in your primary gifting, others are having to compensate for your lack of usage of these spiritual gifts. And when they're not used, we're going to see the analogy of the body later on in chapter 12, that the body is sick. If something's not working or not utilized, it becomes weak. And church, your selfishness is creating illness, potentially, within the body. And I know that can be hard to hear. And that's why one of the reasons I'm so excited how God has orchestrated our Wednesday nights, the me I want to be, with uh, this Sunday morning. I couldn't, I'm couldn't. i not that smart, uh, pr- trust me, <laughs> to figure this out. Um, but God has molded our Wednesday night, the me I want to be, the John Ortenberg book, and tracking with that, tracking with Holy Spirit uh, and the spirit, spiritual gifts on Sundays. For this next several weeks, I believe God is going to challenge us. He's going to motivate us. We had uh, just a full crowd here on Wednesday, but we, we, it's not too late to jump on board on Wednesday night. And the, the point is, is that God has given us so much. He's called us to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him, which is your spiritual uh, sacrifice, which is your spiritual gift, your act of worship. And what I want to challenge us over these next few weeks is that when we come together, that you don't just come here just to get. But I want you to get something, okay? I mean, I, I understand that, and I get that. But I want you to come with the expectation that God would want to use you within this body with the spiritual gifts active in your life. See, God, He gave it all to us. He didn't leave anything back. He didn't hold anything back. And so we as have a responsibility to give back. God wants to use you. He wants to empower you. He wants to do it inside of you. And what I want you to know is that if you've never experienced the spiritual gifts at work in your life, it's not scary. It's powerful. It's beautiful. And there's nothing like it. I could think of stories in my life, and the one that came to mind uh, this week was uh, this year, earlier this year, I had the opportunity, the privilege to go to Africa. And I had studied, and I had planned, and I had a, had a plan, but I'm telling you, and I you know, got a measure of a natural gift of speaking, and I trained in college and got a speech minor. And some of you are thinking, man, he's not all that good. Good thing he got that speech minor because it was worse before that. All right, I know, I know that. But listen, then that's besides the point. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I forgot what I was saying now. <laughs> Look, there's a bird. No, I'm just kidding. I know, I'm just kidding. I went to Africa, and I'm telling you, God took my natural ability, and I, when I stood up before those pastors, there was a supernatural anointing, the spiritual gift of preaching and teaching. It was undeniable. Um, and I felt that on many occasions, but I'm telling you, it was, there's nothing like it. It's beautiful, it's powerful, and I desire that for myself, and I desire that for each and every one of you at school and in your workplace, uh, at the club, 
uh, wherever you go, the spiritual gifts, if you're open, are available. They're at your disposal. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 31, I want to kind of end with this verse. It's at the end of this chapter, and we'll get it in its full context uh, in a few weeks. But listen, it says, But eagerly desire the greater gifts. Eagerly desire the greater gifts. And my question to you this morning is, what are the greater gifts? And I understand there's a context here, but, but what I've, I felt this week in my spirit is that the greater gifts are the ones that are needed at a particular time and in a particular place. There are really no greater gifts. Tongues is not better than interpretation. Healing is not greater than word of, a word of wisdom. But the greater gifts, and obviously he's, he's moving into it to talk about love, which is the greatest gift in, 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 in that context. But the greater gifts are the ones that God allows you to work in, in a particular time and in a particular place at a particular season of your life. And there's a whole lot that is bubbling up inside of me about the next several weeks that is going to be exciting. I, I want you to be here. But what I want you to know is that over these next few weeks, I believe that God wants to bring the blinders off for some. I believe that God wants to empower us like we've never been empowered before. And maybe you've been empowered before, but I believe God wants to do a new thing in your heart and in your life in regards to spiritual gifts. And it's going to be awesome. Praying between services. We've got intercessors in my office that pray uh, during the services. And I was in there sitting down and just kind of getting a breather uh, from the weekend. And, and I was just kind of, and they came in and prayed. And, and as one of the intercessors was praying, um, they said something that we were, Kind of, the, kind of prophetically that we are moving into a new season. In my spirit, in my spirit, I'm like, yes, I, I, I see that, I embrace that, that we're moving into a season of growth, and of depth, and of maturity, as a body. I'm excited, <laughs> uh, like I, I want to, like I feel like my insides are jumping out, and um, and because it involves each and every one of us being a part. And again, it's not scary, and we're going to take a balanced look. And, I, and uh, uh, I've got a little bit of time. Some people, <laughs> I was actually having lunch with a pastor this week, and, uh, you know, pastors are always like, hey, what are you preaching on, you know? And this is a, 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 a non-Pentecostal pastor, and um, and. And, I, and he told me what he's preaching on. And I knew after I said it, I'm like, oh, he's going to ask me what I'm preaching on. And, uh, and so he did. And I said, oh, I'm talking about spiritual gifts. And he just kind of looked at me like, what else is there? You know, that's all you guys talk about, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, like we're going to you know, bring out the snakes next time and, you know, and, and things like that. And I just want you to know, uh, I got a compliment uh, in regards to the message first service. And uh, I just felt like I want to share it. And uh, the person said, we don't come from a Pentecostal background. But they said, we trust you, Pastor. Um, that, you know, that things are going to be in order and in decent, or not indecent, decent. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and uh, I just want you to know that as we talk about these spiritual gifts, we want to bring a balanced look. But there's power. And it's exciting, and it's for us, and we're going to tackle it with enthusiasm, and I'm excited about it. And so I say all that, the greater gifts are the ones that are needed at the time that God puts it on your heart and to move forward in those things, and I believe it's available for everyone. Amen? Amen. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. The first thing I want to address is, and obviously this was not a salvation-based message, but I don't know everyone here. 
And if you're here today and you're away from God, or maybe you've never served God, um, either way, and you're sensing just the Lord kind of stirring in your heart, saying, boy, I need Jesus in my life. Um, this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. Real quickly, the Bible says that, um, uh, that one sin will keep you from an eternity in heaven. Um, that's the truth of God's Word, that one unrighteous act, one lie, one time stealing a grape from the, you know, from the grocery store will keep you from an eternity in heaven. That's the truth. Our sin will keep us from heaven. It separates us. That's what the Bible says. But God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for you and for me. And he loves you very much. And the Bible says that we're all sinners, but the gift of God, salvation is available if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, this morning, if you need to confess your sin, if you need to get your life right with the Lord, would you just be so bold to raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. We've got some resources we want to kind of give you, but who this morning is the Holy Spirit speaking to and you need Jesus in your life? Anyone at all? Just slip up your hand. Just give that opportunity. Say, man, if I were to die today, I don't know that I would go to heaven. But church, you can know for sure. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Okay. I don't see any hands. So if I could have your eyes back on me just for a moment. My personal desire is that I want to be used by God. I mean, that's, uh, that's why I'm in ministry. That's why, you know, I mean, I've given my heart, my life, other than my family. Nothing's more important than what God's called me to do. But so often people say, oh, that's the job of the pastor or the staff, or, you know, the church, or maybe the, the board members, or the, the elders. You know, they're, they're utilizing those gifts. But church, as I understand these gifts, and I'm getting a better understanding every time I'm studying and getting into the, into the Word and getting looking at commentary, um, we, as I understand it, can desire and, even, and go after spiritual gifts but they always bring God glory. And I want us as a church in this season, it's going to be exciting. I, I want you to know, and I want you to bring people back with you, and, and I believe this is going to be a season of growth, but, but that we are able to be used by God at the right time, at the right place. And all we have to do is ask. We ask for the spiritual gifts be at work in our lives. And so I'm going to ask that you would do something with me. I want everyone to stand. And what I'd like you to do, only as you feel led, I don't want to manipulate anyone here, but as you feel led, I want you just to make yourself like you're a, a cup, okay? Like with your hands up. And I want you in your own words to ask the Lord to help you to understand spiritual gifts and to be utilized in your life in some spiritual ways in this next season. And we'll just take a second here just to let do that. And just in your own words, out loud, together, God, we just ask, Lord, that you would move in our lives. That you would touch us. You choose us, God, to fill us, God, to overflowing. That the spiritual gifts would be alive and well and that your power would be at work in this place, and that we would embrace this new season that we're walking into, a season of favor, a season of salvations, a season of strength and of leadership and growing deeper in you, God. God, touch each one that's asking right now. Prepare their hearts. God, even this week as they, they walk in, in their schools, or they walk down the halls of their workplace, or wherever they go in their neighborhood, or with their family or friends, God, that you would utilize them. Give them opportunities, even this week, God. Open up the heavens like we said, sang earlier. We want to see you, God. We want to see you move. We're hungry for you. 
for everything you have for us. Individually, corporately, the Gateway Church, and the church worldwide. God, pour out your Spirit. Touch us, we pray. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Now I want to give you an assignment. I don't, I've, I've done this like two or three times in seven years, or eight years. In fact, next week, I think Mark, or next week, or, oh yeah, October 1st, that's right, was our first Sunday. So we're almost to eight years being here, uh, it's, which is exciting. But I want to give you an assignment. The first thing is that I want every single person, I want you to write this down on your bulletin, take it with you, and I really want to encourage you, I really believe this will help us as we get together next week um, to provide some framework, is to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 in one sitting, okay? To kind of get the context of 12, 13, and 14 together. The second, and you're going to see the spiritual gifts listed there in 8 through 10, and then in verse 28, and uh, you'll see that in chapter 12. But then I also want you to read about spiritual gifts in Romans 12, 6 through 8. So just a couple verses there. One verse in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 11. And then what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. So another couple verses. You could literally do this in probably, even, I'm a, I'm a slow reader. I mean, three hours you should be able to take care of that. I mean, at, at the worst, at worst, <laughs> and it'll be worth it, all right? <laughs> but I want you to take this, and what I believe is that God speaks through his word. It's a perfect document, and I believe that it'll speak to your hearts this week. It'll prepare us as we really start to look at the different spiritual gifts, and, uh, and I hope that you are prayed up and ready for God to work as, as soon as you leave here. I mean, uh, there was a church we, we went to for a long time. Um, there was a sign exiting the church that said, you are now entering the mission field. And uh, I love that. And uh, it was cool. And, uh, and that's the truth. And God wants to use you this week. Let me pray a prayer of benediction. Then you can go. And I want you to know the altars are open for any uh, further uh, prayer. Or if you want to be anointed with oil, uh, we'll stay as long as you need. Uh, but otherwise, go in the grace of God. This is a closing prayer. Lord, go before us, behind us, and all around us, Jesus. Make our ways clear. And Lord, bring us back together to continue to learn, continue to be stretched. And God, I pray that this week would be a supernatural week in the life of every single person here. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you very much. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. Have a wonderful week.